Welcome to Know This Live. I'm Zinkley Esamwa. At this point, about 22% of Americans have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, but the race is on as states see an increase in new cases and hospitalizations. To talk about the road to reach herd immunity, I'm joined by Dr. Matish Lachaweo Davis. She's an infectious disease physician at the John Cochran VA Medical Center and a board member with the St. Louis Department of Health. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, and you know, we're talking at a difficult time in the United States. For about a month, we've seen the daily number of COVID-19 cases increase, deaths are up in about 13 states, and that's even as vaccination rollout has increased. So knowing all of this, are we on the brink of another surge? The choice is ours, um, to, to be quite frank. We could be on the brink of another surge. Um, we need to understand a few things. I get it. We're tired. Pandemic fatigue has, has set in. We promised the public that, that if they did a set number of things that they would get to the other side of this. And over a year later, we're still asking them to do the same thing. So my heart goes out. To complicate that, in December, we saw certain strains, new strains, um, that seem to A, be transmitted faster, but B, now have shown to be a little bit more virulent, a little bit more likely to cause either severe disease or death. I think the combination of both of those things has got us at this place. Um, and so at the end of the day, I am asking people as an infectious disease specialist, as a public health expert, to hold on a little longer. Because if we don't, we will be seeing the surge. And I do want to hone in on a specific state. What we've been seeing out of Michigan is particularly worrisome. I know that Governor Gretchen Whitmer is asking residents to voluntarily avoid uh, doing things like outdoor dining as cases are surging in that state. And it's odd, you could say, because about 40 percent of Michigan residents have already received one dose of the vaccine. So why are we seeing this out of Michigan? It's very interesting epidemiologically because when this pandemic first started, we saw the most at-risk groups that we're used to talking about being hardest hit. We saw older, um, older people and people with pre-existing heart, lung, and other diseases that put them at risk. What we're seeing now is a shift to a much younger demographic, um, which is interesting because they haven't typically been the ones to be sicker. But we're seeing this um, I believe at a time where a few things have happened that we've seen in Michigan. Number one, with schools opening up, we're also seeing this big push towards opening up sports, sporting events. And there have been multiple, multiple cases where there has been strong, strong resistance from people who believe that this should be a rule. Kids should be allowed not only to be back in school, but to take participate in group sports. And the unfortunate thing is that the transmission isn't happening during the sport events. No, the, the transmission is happening when we are, you know, busing kids in or having uh, social events afterwards and congregating. And so we have to shut this down until we get on top of these numbers. So again, in Michigan, we're seeing a few things. We're seeing the variants in play, which I spoke about earlier, but we're seeing a shift to a younger demographic and people now not being as vigilant about gatherings. The same things hold true with or without vaccinations. We've got to be masking. We've got to be socially distancing and washing our hands. And very importantly, we cannot partake in, in, group, in group gatherings and, and large gatherings especially. And so the question almost must be asked, is there a way to do outdoor sports and gather outdoors safely? I ask this especially knowing that CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky uh, urged states to reconsider youth sports, as you pointed out, worrying that it's contributing to the spread of COVID-19. But as you also say, uh, many are pushing back saying, no, these are necessary for young people uh, for their health, mental uh, and physical health as well. So is there a balance or is the answer just don't gather? I think the answer is to understand we're not operating in a vacuum. Think about your loved ones. Think about your children. I'm a mom. I had a pandemic baby last May. I have a four-year-old. I saw firsthand what happened to my baby girl when she was forced to stay home for the better part of a year. It was not easy. But at the end of the day, I believe in doing what needs to be done in the short term for long-term gain. I believe that shutting down sports right now until we can get all the resources available to make sure that when we do open up sports, we do it in the most responsible way is key. This has to happen. We cannot just do this reflexively and based on emotion. 
again, this is not the fault of parents. This is certainly not the fault of kids. This is a pandemic that is unprecedented and we need to do what we need to do to get to where we all want to be, which is our new normal. And I, of course, want to congratulate you on your pandemic pregnancy. Quite a feat. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I know that the CDC has said, uh, and experts have said, rather, that we're going to need to reach between 70 to 90 percent of Americans protected with a vaccine in order, in order to reach herd immunity uh, to see transmission rapidly slow. But many are now worried that enough Americans will not be willing to get the vaccine for this to happen. Is that a concern of yours? It is, but I firmly believe that data is justice and data drives policy. So we need to continue looking at the numbers to understand where are the deficits. And as a person who has seen this hitting our communities of color the hardest, black and brown communities have had disproportionate impact in both cases and hospitalizations, but also unfortunately in deaths. We then saw right, when a vaccine became available, that many of them said they would not take a vaccine if made available, but that changed once we answered their questions and understood the mistrust that was underlying that. And now we see them being one of the lowest groups to say they won't get a vaccine, and yet, and yet, they are still the least likely to get a vaccine. Access is an issue. Equity is an issue. And we need to pay close attention to, ex to, 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 to equity so we can get vaccines to the folks who want them. We also know that there's a large group of people that still don't want the vaccine, and that requires education that is culturally competent, that speaks to different groups and meets them where they're at, that requires trusted resources and trusted messengers. And they all don't look the same. I'm not a trusted messenger for everyone. So we have to be thoughtful about this. The White House has dedicated close to $6 billion to these efforts, um, rural communities, communities of colors, education. And I do believe that if we really hunker down, the community do what it needs to be done, and we focus on, on equity, we will get to herd immunity. And I'm glad you honed in on that, right? We've been seeing inequities in distribution. There's still need for education around vaccine hesitancy, but also, of course, new strains with uh, the B117 variant. Knowing all this, what does the next year look like if we don't get to herd immunity? The next year looks like a lot of the same, a lot of frustration, but let's be real. I don't think you can expect people to stay indoors for another year. And so if we don't get to herd immunity and folks aren't willing to do what they need to do to help us get there, we will continue to wake up to a Groundhog's Day um, of sorts of the same. But more importantly, more importantly, people's lives are at risk. Fam people have lost family members, friends and colleagues during this. We don't want to see any more. And so if we don't reach herd immunity, if we don't do what we need to do, we will continue to lose the people we love. And even the people that have survived will tell you it's not an easy journey back. Long COVID, as we call it, and, and symptoms that persist for weeks and months and longer are very real. We don't know how this impacts us in the long term. Let's not take that chance. Let's do what we need to do. And I want to shift knowing that you are an expert in um, HIV as well and ask you about the latest results from an HIV vaccine trial and preliminary data looks promising around that. What do you think a timeline for an HIV vaccine could be? I think it's too early to say. As an HIV expert, I think I'm a little bit biased in having been burned over decades now of trying to, tr to get a vaccine. And so I'm the sort of person who sort of takes a step back and says, let's look at it. But let's be clear here. This mRNA technology is unprecedented. It's an absolute triumph of science. I never thought a year ago I'd be sitting in a position to see vaccines for COVID, let alone vaccines, this many vaccines with this great efficacy data and safety data. And so I believe the sky is the limit and we can be hopeful. What we're seeing right now in these preliminary studies and phase one clinical trials is very promising, but it's a long, long way to go before we can get to the type of success that we're seeing around a COVID vaccine. So hope, I think hope is always a good thing. Yeah, and it seems like it's almost needed now more than ever. There's been a surge reported or an outbreak of HIV in West Virginia that's been making headlines. The CDC said in a letter 
that it was ready to support combating the outbreak, outbreak if directed by the state. But it's been contentious, with some saying uh, the end of a clean needle exchange program might have led to this. Why do you think we are seeing this outbreak in West Virginia right now? You know what happened? We spent so much time appropriately focused on this pandemic that it's so easy to forget that there are other conditions in medicine that exist and have to be focused on. Um, quite frankly, we were stretched too thin. And in the care of people living with HIV, the same people and the same demographics that have been left up behind in COVID, in other disease states, it's again an issue of disparities. It's again an issue of inequitable health care access. It's again an issue of the people with the most to lose having the least to support them. And so we saw a shift to telemedicine, but does everyone have a working phone and working internet? No, we saw a shift to not being able to come in person. And so are you able to make the same connections and, and outreach to people? And then, like you said, we have these programs around PrEP, prevention, needle exchange programs that have been critical, critical in combating um, HIV over the, the last few years specifically, but you know, since its beginning here in this country. And so we have to get back to basics and we have to support the same people. Um, and really, I believe, put so much by way of funding, policy, and resources in the community health organizations and leaders that have already earned the trust of these of their communities who do this work every day. They need to be empowered to be able to reach out at a grassroots level to folks on the ground. And to briefly end where we began back on COVID, what is your message to members of the public who maybe are tired of all that the pandemic has required when it comes to distancing and quarantining. What is your message right now? I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for prioritizing your loved ones, your communities, and yourselves. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for pushing back and, and pushing us to be better and to be better educators and to be more accountable. And to ask you to please continue to prioritize not just your health and your priorities, but those of the people you love and the communities you're around you so that we can get out of this. Regardless of where you're from, what you believe, one thing remains true. COVID is very real. Um, it has devastated our communities, but we have hope. We have an entire toolbox at our disposal that can get us to herd immunity and to a better future. That includes a vaccine when one becomes available to you. That includes masking, continuing to mask, continuing to social distance, washing your hands and avoiding large gatherings. Please do what you can so that we can get to where we all want to be. Well, Dr. Mati Shlachaweo Davis, thank you so much for your time and sharing your insights with us. Thank you. Yes, and thanks to everyone for watching. This has been Know This Live. I'm Zinclay Esamwa.